Evening all, it's uh, time for our fourth live session to support learners getting ready for the next Unit 6 exam, BTEC National Business. And uh, we've been here for three nights already at 6.30, exploring the different ways in which the Unit 6 exam, Unit 6 exam, easy for some people to say, is assessed. And we've saved perhaps the best for last. Well, actually, we've saved the least marks for last. We're looking at the structure and presentation of the report in Activity 1 and the presentation in activity two. So that's what our focus is today. And I've got a couple of worked examples and a little bit of guidance drawn from the most recent uh, unit six examiner's reports just to pass on to you. And hopefully we'll have five minutes or so at the end to pick up any general Q&A about unit six as you prepare to see uh, the, the case study in the next exam, which I think is next week, isn't it? Uh, the part A for the January exam sitting. Uh, welcome if you're joining us live. I can see uh, quite a few people in the house who I recognize live from previous sessions this week so well done for getting through uh, one or more of the live sessions of course the session is as always with our live stream is recorded so don't worry you'll be able to catch up if you wish to on all the previous sessions as well as this one as well as download the slides i'll share that link shortly let's just go to uh, a quick reminder as to what we're going to cover tonight in our first session on uh, when was it monday we had a quite a long session there looking at how to explore and use make the best use of the Unit 6 case study and the information. Uh, the following night, session two, we looked at how you can impress the examiner by your use of relevant principles of management. In other words, the underlying specification content where relevant in your report and presentation. Last night, we took a look at the sort of the bottom bit of each activity. It's where you make recommendations and suggest actions, but also consider the balance. Where is the, you know, what, what might go wrong and also what the alternative approaches might be. And tonight we're going to sort of wrap it all up with just a bit of a few thoughts on uh, how you can structure 
both the report and the presentation. So that's tonight. And we also mentioned, of course, didn't we, in the previous sessions that there's 88 marks going. So uh, don't forget, and this is really important when it comes to structure, it's 44 marks for each. Don't spend all of your time in particular on activity one. So tonight we're looking at the two parts of unit six, which uh, are about structure and presentation. They're each worth eight marks, making 16 marks in total for structure and presentation. That's how the marks are awarded. Now, when we're looking at structure and presentation, a lot of students think, ah, is it about making it look nice? Is it about look, making it look impressive with a lovely cover, lots of images, flashing lights and more, transitions, animations? Absolutely not. It really doesn't matter one bit. That, that, that won't get you any marks. Structure and presentation is about what you write. So does it have a logical structure? Is it laid out in a, in a sensible way? Uh, does it discuss and demonstrate context, relevant management principles? Does it use relevant business terminology? That's the kind of thing that determines how many marks or which band you get into. And generally, actually, for structure and presentation, learners tend to do quite well on this. These are the assessment foci that they lose fewest marks on. But they're still important and we want to do as well as we can. So uh, we mentioned, didn't we, that uh, to get to a merit, you need to be aiming to get into the middle of Mark Band 3 for as many of the AFs as possible. And uh, in this case, there will be five or six marks going for uh, the structure of your report and five or six marks going for the structure of your presentation. But we want you to be aiming for Band 4 in as many assessment foci as possible. So here's what the examiner's looking for. They're looking for a logical structure. They're looking for you to use management concepts and appropriate business language in context. That's how they'll examine your uh, structure and presentation. Uh, now, the, the important point to note is that nowhere ever in the examiner's report or the mark scheme does it say what structure the examiner wants. It's entirely up to you. There's lots of flexibility, lots of different ways in which you can lay it out. I've come up with a way. You can take it or leave it. I think it works, but by no means meant to be the only way. You may well have practiced a particular approach which works for you, which is fine. The main thing is to complete activity one and activity two because the examiner has said that students are spending too long on activity one and wasting time on the presentation. So whatever you do, however you split your time between activity one and activity two, don't spend time making fancy report covers, uh, copying big chunks and writing big chunks of the case of information out into your speaker notes or into your report. So don't waste any time creating images or downloading them, adding them to your presentation to make it look visually interesting. Complete waste of time, as are animations and transitions. Complete waste of time. It might make you feel better, but it's not going to score you any marks. And every mark counts in Unit 6. We want you to be spending your time developing your points and using the case study not trying to make something look good. So I think my overall advice there is keep, thing, uh, keep things simple. And I just wanted to just point this out. This was an interesting comment in the most recent examiner report. I've just drawn this from uh, June 23. Yeah, so last summer. Still, and this has been repeated actually time and time again, the feedback from the examiners is that students are doing better in activity one scoring more marks than activity two. I think from memory, it's about sort of seven or eight marks difference. Um, and a key reason for that is that they're spending too long on activity one and not enough time on activity two, rushing activity two, and therefore not giving themselves a good chance. So don't forget there are 44 marks going for both. So uh, whilst it might take a little bit longer to write a report in Word than it is to uh, dash out some slides and speaker notes in PowerPoint, make sure you allocate sufficient time to give activity two a really good go. We don't want you to lose any marks because you may be uh, overcook your report. So that's uh, that's the second part of exam gold, isn't it, from the examiner's report. Now we're going to start with uh, just with activity one. Now this is not meant to be the only way you can structure your report, but I've had a go at writing this for the case study and also for some, for some previous past papers, and I think it, it kind of works. And what I like about it, uh, although I would say that because I wrote it, <laughs> is that it try, it kind of does what a business person would do if they were writing a report, in this case, to the board of CLS. So here's my suggested possible structure. I'm not saying definitely use this, but I think it works. I would start with an introduction, but definitely not two or three pages. It's just a scene setting paragraph and just a little bit that says, here's what this report contains. 
here's what we're doing just to explain and that's exactly what you get in a normal business report uh, an introduction and also what's following as the reader what can i expect to see next i would then get on to where the real marks are earned which is to develop an answer to the task that you've been given for in this case activity one so i would start with whatever the task is in this case it was an issue wasn't it or a challenge if you remember the uh, uh, the cls case study talks about the uh, the management and lead leadership issues so whatever that is or it could be the challenges that the business faces so i would deal with the issue and i would try to firstly set out what the findings are and the evidence are evidences from the case study and how they link to business goals i think that's a good good place to start and then at the same time so rather than going on to a different issue i would then bring in my recommendation stroke alternative approach i think it kind of makes sense for the recommendation to follow what you've identified as being the issue deal with all that bit of content at the same time that's not to say that's not the, it's not to say it's the only way of doing it because clearly you could just go through all the issues and then come back and come up with your recommendations but i think the danger with that is there's a lot of duplication could you could find yourself in uh, in some time trouble so i'll show you an example of that in a minute now i'd then go on to do it again for a separate issue doing exactly the same thing example coming up now do you need two three four or five well if you've got time but only if you've got time, because it's always better. So you definitely need two, don't you? Because we know that it asks for issues or challenges. So that's two. If you've got time, develop a third. But only if it's a really good point. I wouldn't be bothering with a fourth or fifth or sixth, because that is genuinely wasting time. Better to develop a, a point, a recommendation fully in context, rather than just you know, develop a shopping list of points. So if you've got time, great. But if not... Think, right, okay, well, I'm coming towards the end of activity one now. I need to write a little nice comp nice conclusion. And here I would just sort of summarize the main conclusions and a bit of a sign-off saying, delighted to, rep to report to you. Please get in touch if you'd like to discuss the report. So should we have a look at that in action? And uh, looking in the live chat, really want to get your thoughts on this as we go. So please do post your comments into the live chat. Uh, let me know what you think. I'm only going to do one of these... Uh, issues and challenges, but I will show you an example of an introduction and a conclusion to see whether you think it's something you'd want to do. Okay, so here's my introduction. And of course, you have to imagine this is probably just under a third of a page on a Word document. It has to be at 12 points, doesn't it? 12 point font. So it starts by saying this report considers the key management and leadership issues and how they impact the success of the proposed strategy. That's just taken from the task. In other words, you've been you've asked me for this. Here it is. Now, I, I've, I've deliberately excluded what I see quite a lot of learners using, which is to say, uh, my name is whatever, Claude, and I am a management consultant, and I've been asked by the board to write this, and uh, blah, 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 blah. Waste of time, I think. Just get the report going, and then move on to a scene-setting sentence or two that sets the scene. So I've written a little one here. What do you think? I, I just call it background. So you could call it introduction or whatever you want to call it. So after 50 years of success under Terry Brown's CLS has developed into a well-established, trusted retailer serving customers from 50 stores. It's got a reputation for a culture of customer service. However, that's great. However, the competitive environment is changing, more intense, necessitating strategic change and putting a, a big emphasis on management and leadership to guide the business through the change. So it's not meant to be critical. It's just saying, Here's a situation, a business that's done well 50 years is now perhaps going to have to change a little bit quicker. And I think that's just a good way just to set the scene. So before I get onto my first issue, I think just a few bullet points that say, what, how am I going to explain this to you, the examiner? But I've done it in a way that is like in a report. So this report is structured like as follows. So firstly, we have identified the key issues. For each issue, we've summarized some evidence from the information provided from the case study and thought about how that links to the aims of the business because that's what we know we have to do isn't it to get those distinctions and then we've made some recommendations and suggested alternative approaches for each issue so it really says what's following for each issue is what it says on the tin and then our conclusion contains a summary and i think that's all you need for an introduction perfect i think because then you can get into developing your first point which is the issue and a recommendation. So 
how do we do it? Now, this is what I've gone with. You might have a different approach, which is fine, but I've sort of found myself coming back to this approach again and again because it kind of does what the Mark scheme wants you to do, which is to uh, synthesize, to come up with a, a big point, a good point, but then to link it to the evidence from the case study. So there's my context, linking it to the aims of the business. So that's why this matters. Then coming up with a, a recommendation that is in context to the business, but then showing some balance. So my risks and alternatives is my balance. And if I can do that quite well for each issue, then I think I've met the demands by and large of the case study. Uh, so John is asking, how do you connect this to the question or is the question just a rough guideline? Well, what I, if I just go back, uh, I'll just stick that to comment the question on the screen there, Johnny, just so people can see it uh, on the live chat. If I just go back a slide, the question is here, isn't it? Uh, hang on, let's go here. So we were asked, weren't we, in activity one, to identify the key management and leadership issues and how they affect the achievement of the aims of the business and to make recommendations. Well, if you look at the second and the third bullet there, that is basically the question, isn't it? But we've 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 written it in a way that says, here's what this, this report does. But basically that's saying bullet point two, in fact, no, bullet point one, two and three, are basically saying, I'm answering the question in activity one. Yeah, so hopefully that will become that will become clear. So those are my headings. Let's have a look at an example. Obviously, I try, I try to do this at least twice. If I could do it three times, that's great, but I just want to make sure I do it well. So here's my first one. So I'd have a heading that says issue. In this case, I've, I've gone with the one we discussed on Monday, the approach to change management. So let's, let's go through those headings. Our finding, just a sentence. What have we found? It's a report. We've, we've been asked to report to the board on it. So Al Alicia is making significant changes very quickly, which may have the effect of increasing resistance to necessary change uh, from key stakeholders and such as staff or customers, and also delaying achievement of the aim. So that's a finding, isn't it? The case that he's telling us that she's moving really quickly, that might be a good thing, might not, but that's the finding. What's the evidence? And I love that heading, subheading evidence because that, that's an invitation for you to draw out one or two pieces of information from the case study, perhaps from the tables, perhaps from the, something that someone said, perhaps a trend, perhaps an action. In other words, paddle. <laughs> uh, so it's just it's an invitation to use the case study, isn't it? Not copy whole chunks of it out, but just to draw a bit of evidence. So CLS has grown steadily, one store per year on average, bit of application. Staff and customers have stayed loyal. Alicia now seems, seems to have a low concern for the values and traditions of CLS and her priority is fast growth, lower costs, greater business efficiency, perhaps uh, you know, over customer service. A consequence of that appears to be higher labor turnover, three times what it was. Um, I think it was uh, Johnny in a previous session, he pointed out labor turnover was three times what it was under Terry. So I've, I've used that. So thank you for that. And the checkout waiting time is twice the previous average. So there's the evidence. I don't need any more than that. That suggests yet yeah, that we're moving quickly and there's some issues here. So the next thing is why does that matter? Well, this is where you link back to the goals. So always, always, always link back, keep coming back to the stated aims and goals. So one aim is to double sales to 100 million. Well, if customer loyalty falls, that actually means you're less likely to hit 100 million, isn't it? Sales are going to fall. And it could be that if staff get demotivated by this sort of autocratic style, uh, that's actually going to make things even worse. So not only are customers getting a bit annoyed about all of this, but so too are staff. And in supermarket retailing, it's really important to have your customers and your staff on board, I think. So Alicia is correct. The business needs to change. But if it wants to achieve its aims, perhaps she's going to have to adjust her approach to change management. Now, that's our point developed. That's all you need, I think. The next bit is the examiner asked for a recommendation. So here we go. So the recommendations need to be in context. So I'm saying here, and you could come up with any recommendation, but I, I wanted something which I thought CLS could do. And you don't have to have three recommendations. You could just have two. No problem at all. So to minimize resistance to change, we recommend at CLS test tests the changes and the ideas in a few shops first, 
rather than changing everything all at once to see how customers and staff react. For example, you know, before they roll out e-commerce, uh, develop a more a better communication plan. So it seems to me from the case study that they haven't done a lot of communication or consultation. So maybe a plan, a program to explain what's going on, why the changes are necessary, and also perhaps to explain the benefits to stakeholders. And also I suggested maybe a, a simple way for feedback. So head office staff and store staff to be able to provide feedback openly, hopefully, uh, so that they can identify the concerns. So Cyrus asking, do these recommendations need to be in more detail? I don't think so. No, I think I think these recommendations are fine because if you think about it, we've already, if I go back, we've already said, here's the issue. Here's the evidence. Why do we need to change? Here are our recommendations that address those issues. And then the final part of this approach says, and by the way, there's no guarantee these recommendations will work. So those recommendations are in context, they're developed, they're explained, they link to the issue. But my last bit, this is where I provide the balance, I think. And I think it's enough to, to, to meet the demands of the, the mark scheme. So the balance is basically saying, of course, this might not work. Why not? So I'm saying overcoming resistance to change won't be easy. Uh, what will it depend on? Well, the success of our recommendations will, I think, largely depend on, on Alicia and her team taking a different approach to how they communicate. And there's a risk that if they if they make the changes too quickly and without consultation, you're going to get such res significant resistance that uh, actually sales start to fall. And therefore, they're less likely to meet the aims. So you've got to, you've, it's all going to depend on how careful they are and how well they communicate the need for change, I think. That's the, that's the that's the risk. It might go wrong. What's the alternative? Well, we just need an alternative approach, don't we, that's relevant. So the alternative is just to crack on, push ahead with making changes at speed without consultation, communication, a bit like what she's doing now. Is that the best alternative? Well, however, that might not be in the best interest of the business. So you might say that might result in quicker change. However, it may not be attractive because you're going to get more resistance. So I think in that risks and alternative approach, it's not perfect, but it's definitely in context. And it's about, it follows from this, this idea that you know, the recommendation is to take your time with change management here because it's all going too quickly. And I think that's all wrapped up nicely. So um, Hattie's asking, is it one paragraph per recommendation? Uh, no, I think I would, I would, I would keep the recommendations uh, as well. You can have paragraphs if you wish. I, I'm, I'm keeping them as bullets here because I think there's enough in there that explains what the recommendation is and what the risks and the alternative approaches are. You could develop any one of those bullet points with another sentence or two if you wished, but I think that flows. And if you've got time, of course, you should do that. But I reckon that's okay. And if you take if you take that page and the previous page, that's probably a page and a half of writing for that, that particular issue. And if you have time, you develop it further. And I do that twice, at least twice. If you've got time, a third issue, for sure. Why not? If there is a third issue that you think is really important. But in general, you're better off developing these issues and the recommendations and the balance in more depth with more context. That's always better than just a, a shopping list of points. So it's all about how quickly you can write and type. <laughs> and then lastly, because it's a report, and we're thinking about structure and layout, well, reports have conclusions. So we've dealt with the, we've introduced it. We've dealt with each issue. We've given them recommendations. We've shown some balance. At the end, it's just saying, look, if you follow these recommendations, we think that you'll, you'll do better in terms of your stated aims. You're well placed, but you need to you need to think about these aims. And then a nice sentence at the end will be pleased to discuss this report and provide further support as required by the board, because that's what you'd say in a business report. You'd say, here's our thoughts. Very happy to meet and discuss what's in this report. Please ask us in and we'll charge you some more as consultants. Well, that was me back in the day. Um, and there we go. And I think. I think I think when I wrote the full version, it was about four pages, four and a bit pages of 12 size font with my introduction, 
my issues developed and my now's conclusion. And that's, I think that's a decent management report for activity one. I would hope that would definitely be Mark Band 3 and hopefully even Mark Band 4. Be interested to hear what you think in the live chat there. Uh, let's just add a question whilst we go. John is asking, uh, when I get the case study in part A, can I practice these on all the issues and then use the ones that exam that are relevant to the question? Well, of course, yeah, that's the whole point, isn't it, in part A? Think about the case study. Think about what kind of issues the examiner might ask you to consider. It could be management and leadership issues. It could be human resource planning issues. It could be issues around quality, issues around culture, or a combination of all of them. So, But it will be pretty obvious from the case study where most of the issues are. So absolutely, absolutely start to think about what the issues are, what your recommendations might be, what's the evidence. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. The only thing, though, Johnny and everybody else is, obviously you can't take your notes in. So it needs to be in your old noggin here before you go into part B. Um, let's uh, let's take as we go. Let's take uh, Aman's question here. We'll do a bit of a Q and A uh, at the end, though. Uh, this is relevant, of course, to both uh, the report and to the presentation. And this is really coming back to what we covered on uh, Tuesday when I'm talking about the principles of management. Do you have to include motivational theory? Uh, in in, a in a addressing additional discussions on the subject of motivational theory. So the question really is, how do you demonstrate knowledge and understanding of management theory? The examiner has actually said in June 23 that learners who use management motivational theories such as Maslow, such as uh, Hertzberg or Taylor, relevantly in discussing the issues and their recommendations, that added weight to the quality of their response. Whereas a lot of learners just talked in very general terms about motivation. So if there are relevant theories and you can use them relevantly to help explain uh, your issues and recommendations or balance, absolutely use them. But don't feel the need to add them in just for the sake of it. Well, there we go. We spent a little bit of time there on the report. What about the presentation? Now, I know we, we kind of touched on this, didn't we? Uh, that's nice. <laughs> Seems like a long time ago, 24 hours ago. But I just wanted to very briefly just make a couple of extra points. I know we did that last night, but just maybe a few more points about the PowerPoint. First point, just a reminder, 44 marks for the presentation. So don't leave this to the last I don't know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes. That's half the marks. So don't spend two hours on the report and, and 45 minutes, 50 minutes on the presentation. Try to make sure that you you give each a, a good effort. I think it takes a bit longer to write a report, type it all out, but don't just do the presentation activity too as an afterthought. We said that already. So how do we how do we do the PowerPoint? Again, there's no structure here. There's no the, the examiner's not saying here's what I'm expecting in terms of layout and structure, except they have say they have said forget all the fancy stuff with <laughs> animations and images and transitions. Complete waste of time. But Again, I think it's a similar approach. It's about maybe a little introduction. I think it's a good idea just to put a slide in, just reminds, as you would in a report, reminds uh, everybody, the reader, what the business aims are. And then we get into, and I've suggested a four-slide approach for each issue, but you can do it in three or two or five. It's up to you. A similar approach to activity one. Just because I think it helps, it helped me shape my thoughts on the on the challenge of the of the of the question. You can have as many slides as you wish. You can try and cram it all onto one if you want, but I just think it looks quite professional. Just to break it down into uh, breaking each issue or action or challenge, whatever the examiner asks for in the question, break it down into something which does what the mark scheme says they're looking for. So an introduction slide, nice and simple. A reminder of the aims, and then I've got an example, of course, just slightly tweaked from last night for each of the issues I want to address, and then the conclusion slide that says, thanks very much for watching. Any questions, please, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is how it would look. Keep it simple. A report to the board. <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, a reminder of the business aims. So I think that's really important because you would definitely do that in a presentation. You'd say, don't forget, this is what you're trying to achieve when you present into the board. And then I'd have an introduction that says, you know, hit, we're going to go through three or two or three issues here, and here's how I'm going to present them. 
And this is the, the first slide that basically says we've identified, I've said three ways that culture might impact the business. If it's two, it's two. If it's four, it's four. If it's three, it's three. Um, yeah, I'll come back. Yeah, let's, let's put Karen's on here. So far, the consensus was six slides in total. Okay, three slides per issue. That would make it nine plus the introduction, 10 slides, yeah. I think that feels about right. I mean, I think mine would be 10. It would be intro introduction, stroke, business aims, four slides for one issue, four slides for another issue, conclusion. But in a way, it's not, not the number of slides, it's what you say and the structure. And as long as there's a logical structure, I think uh, I think that's fine. Uh, but there's, there's nothing, there is nothing in any mark scheme or examiner report, unless I've read them backwards, that says, here's how many slides the examiner is expecting. Just doesn't exist. If there was, it would say so in the mark scheme, wouldn't it? It just needs to have a logical structure. So let's just quickly just remind you of what we did last night. Uh, and here's that we've just picked one. Now, don't forget your slide has to have two elements. It has to have something on the slide that you're presenting, but it also has to have some, some speaker notes, stroke, script. And basically the speaker notes are the, 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 the detail, aren't they? The points you're going to make, the little bit of extra detail, maybe some evidence that you want to to make. You might say, for example, um, you know, don't forget to mention the following pieces of data, whatever. So to some extent, what I've found is it's a bit easier to write the slides first, then paste them into the speaker notes and update the speaker notes. So you've got a, some nice detail in there. Then if you need to go back to the slide and just tighten them up a bit, maybe take a few words out. So here's my four slide approach. <laughs> other, other approaches are available. I've started by saying, what well, the issue here is the resistance to technology, because we're talking about e-commerce. The problem, the business isn't used to e-commerce, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a lot of resistance. So we went through this last night, didn't we? Uh, now, don't forget, for each slide, we need some speaker notes. So I've just added under the slide there just the starting point for my speaker notes. I could maybe add a few more here and there. Don't just copy and paste whole chunks of stuff from Activity 1 into the speaker notes. Don't just copy the... Case study, that's a waste of time. Try to include speaker notes that would be useful if a speaker was presenting. So it doesn't have to be the full word for word script, but it could maybe explain the bullets so that uh, it helps a speaker. That's the idea of a speaker note, a bit of extra context maybe, or maybe a couple of bullets that say, don't forget to mention, because that's what goes into speaker notes, isn't it? Um, there's the problem. Why does it matter? I've come up with three or four bullets that link it to the case study, so very similar to the report. Recommendations, and obviously for each of these recommendations, you'd have a little bit of speaker note to explain why you're recommending it. So let's take one there. Um, conduct skills audit to identify key training needs. My speaker notes might say, important to find out uh, what skills are missing from CLS stores and how extra skills might be needed, such as handling picking devices to make sure the right products are picked for the e-commerce orders. Uh, that would be a nice sort of speaker note, wouldn't it? Just to add a little bit of extra detail. Recommendations, and it's just like the report, risks, alternative approach. So in a way, it's easier to write. It's just bullets. <coughs> in this case, introducing e-commerce isn't going to be easy. It might be costly. Um, you might say there's too many words on this. I could turn those into speaker notes really quickly and then just uh, trim them a little bit but basically we we're saying as weren't we last night that actually with e-commerce you've got to be really careful so the alternative approach is to go slower the alternative approach is basically using pilot stores isn't it to test out this whole new system iron out the the bugs iron out the problems sort out the training all that kind of stuff we went through that last night but uh, that's that gives me the balance isn't it, it gives me the balance and saying look there's a, there's a different way of doing this and there we go. Now, so therefore, we'll come back to the Q&A shortly. Uh, I asked somebody emailed me last night saying, could you just summarize what we need to do to get a merit or even better a distinction? Well, in a way, this is quite a nice little summary, isn't it, of, of what we've done in the last four sessions. Uh, if you're aiming for a merit, which would need to be mark band three on average, uh, or a distinction, which is basically mark band four on average, what do you need to do? Well, in both the report and the presentation, here it is. Use the case study all day long, relevantly. Don't just copy it out, but draw out some key pieces of information, data, and what have you. So that's our paddle approach, isn't it? 
always, always, always link back to the aims and goals every time because it matters. Develop your points as fully as possible, not page after page, but try to explain how and why. That's a relevant recommendation or why it's an issue. And we've showed you how to do that. Use appropriate management terminology and principles. So if you're talking about motivating employees and uh, bonuses and rewards, use terms like bonuses, rewards, financial motivation, maybe even bring in motivational theorists if they're relevant, like, I don't know, Taylor or Maslow or Hertzberg. Where you're making recommendations, show some balance. So suggest alternative approaches and also suggest areas where that recommendation may not be successful. It's not a whole page, but it's, you know, it's, it's showing that you recognize that not everything is certain in business. And lastly, this is what we've done tonight. You get marked for AF4 and af eight on what you write. There's no set format, but what you write, isn't it? The structure. Does it look professional? Does it look like somebody is a business presenter who's been through the issues and is reporting back or presenting? Does it have headings that make sense? Does it explain what you're doing? That's what structure and presentation is all about. And I think um, I think that does the trick. Uh, right, let's let's do a bit of Q and A whilst we're going. Uh, by the way, I'll make this uh, this download available as always at tutu.net forward slash live. Uh, Amma's saying, could you present it as follows? So this is activity two, yeah? An introduction slide, a slide outlining the aims. Yeah, did that. A slide encompassing all the issues. Yeah, a slide presenting all the recommendations. Yeah, you could. You could. Yeah, uh, absolutely you could, yeah. I mean, all I've tried to do is for the slides that develop the issue and the recommendation is just to break it up a bit because I think they kind of they kind of flow. Um, but yeah, you absolutely could. Um, don't get too hung up about the number of slides. People are saying that Pearson is saying there's a minimum of six. Okay, well, if there's a minimum of six, great. But you're going to be doing more than – you're going to be doing at least six, aren't you? So uh, I think just the key is uh, – Using the case study, relevant points. Let's add another one here. Cyrus so saying, does the information on the slides have to relate to the ones in the report written or new ideas? Ah, oh, great question. Well, don't forget the activity two is a different question from activity one. Completely different. So in our CLS case, activity one was all about the management and leadership issues, whereas activity two was about the culture of the business and the proposed and change management, wasn't it? So there's always going to be a little bit of crossover, but basically you can't copy and paste what you've done in activity one into activity two because they are separate activities with separate questions. So I know a lot of learners just basically copy and paste. Well, you, by definition, you can't be answering the same question if you do that. So no, the information on the slides in activity two has to answer the question in activity two, not, anti not activity one, because they are different, which is why you need to spend a bit longer on activity two. We've got a few minutes. If anybody else wants to ask any questions, I'll look I'll look out in the live chat. We'll stick them on the screen here. Just whilst we do that, uh, I'll just quickly remind you of, uh, I'll keep an eye out on the live chat, a quick reminder of... Um, <laughs> Uh, how the unit is uh, split up. So next week, part A, if you've not seen this before, we dealt with it just at the first, our first session, you've got a minimum of six hours scheduled time to start working on the case study. The case study you see in part A will be the same case study you see in part B. You can spend as long as you like on part A. There is no restriction. You are allowed to take it home, take it home over Christmas, work on it. <laughs> over the new year. Um, you can write notes on part A. You can do what you like on part A, except you have to work independently. Your teacher can't give you any further support. When you come into part B, it's a three-hour exam, although you may be allowed a, a, a comfort schedule, a scheduled comfort break. And of course, some learners may be given some, some extra time. Uh, it's three hours. But part A, you can do what you like. You can use the internet. You can... You can do like what you like. It's low control. The only thing you can't do is seek help from your teacher.
So that was a quick reminder of that one. Uh, have we got some other questions coming in? Let's have a look. Uh, a few motivational quotes coming in from, from John and also asking how long the exam is. We've dealt with that one. Any other questions on unit six before we, before we sign off? Uh, let's have a look at this question here from Alison. Do we start to look at part A next Wednesday under supervised conditions? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is next Wednesday, isn't it? I think. Yeah, part A is when you first see the case study. It, it's supervised, but it's low control. So it basically means, you know, you start looking at it. You can have access to, the, to your notes, to the internet, whatever. The only thing you can't do is have any help uh, from the people in the room. So, uh, yeah, over to you. Start to think about the case study. We dealt with that, didn't we? Start to pick out the key features. Start to maybe look at some of the information, the data. Start to think about the kind of issues and uh, actions and recommendations that the examiner might ask you for. Lots to do. On that matter, John's asking, John is asking, will you be going over the case study? Well, I've just said, haven't I, that when the case study is, is shown to you, that's it. The assessment is live. Nobody can help you. So I'd love to but I don't want to break the rules and neither am I going to break the rules. So no is the answer. I will not be going through uh, as Karen's, uh, Karen's pointing out, no help is allowed once part A is issued. You're on your own, but you've got so much time. So no, I won't be going over the case study, but I'll be keeping my fingers crossed for everybody on, uh, on the 12th as you start to look at it. Any other questions about Unit 6? I hope you found it helpful, these four sessions. And of course, the uh, the download of the PowerPoint, there might be one or two little ideas in there, which is uh, might might help 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 you prepare when you stay when you see the case study. Let's give it a few more seconds to see whether anybody else has got any observations on these sessions or specific questions about Unit Six. Just whilst we're doing that. Uh, this is, hasn't come through on the live chat yet, but um, just to remind you of what the grey boundaries are, uh, they they don't change a lot. The average mark in the summer was 41, almost 42, which have clearly got you a pass. Uh, just a bit short of a merit, but the middle bar, middle mark, middle of mark band three is 53 marks. So uh, if you're aiming for middle band three, if you get that, you, that would never have not got you, if that makes sense, uh, a merit in previous sittings. So really, I'm expecting those grey boundaries to be something similar, something similar this year. Okay. Uh, uh, here's a question from Alison. So can we teach on Unit 6 but not about the issue case study? Absolutely. Yeah. Too right. You can continue to teach the underlying content. Uh, just can't mention the case study. Can't mention a live assessment. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. John's saying, uh, this might be tongue in cheek, I suspect. It's going to get more than 17. What happens if I get 17? Do I fail? Uh, well, it depends what the grade boundaries are, doesn't it? But uh, if you get 18, that could be a near pass, couldn't it? But less than 18, uh, you might have to take. I have another go at the unit. You'll get more than 18, trust me. If, you, if you're on these live streams, you're going to get a lot more than 18. Um, yeah, awesome stuff. Right, massive thanks to a number of people who, like Johnny and Karen and others who've been with me for all of these four sessions live, taking time out of, I know what's a really busy time of the year as both a teacher and a student. Many thanks for joining me live. I hope you found the session useful. If you have, uh, give the old thumbs up on YouTube. Uh, that helps the algorithm. Uh, suggest this to other victims of Unit 6 or people taking Unit 6. Uh, spread the word if you found it useful. Don't forget, we've also got a whole bunch of stuff we've been doing recently on Unit 2 and Unit 3 and uh, recently recorded a video, which is still on YouTube, about Unit 7. So lots of stuff out there if you've got some other unit exams coming up after Christmas. I wish you all the best with Unit 6. I hope the case study is, uh, is fun to read and interesting and more importantly, easy to easy to uh, to revise and plan for. But whatever it's in there, as long as you keep using that case study and using the techniques we've covered, you are going to be in good shape and uh, wishing you all the best when you start part A and in the unit six exam in, uh, in Jan. For now, I'm going to sign off. Wishing you all the best. Cheers. <laughs>